All right. We are on episode 15 of Rockford Reading Daily. We are reading Have Black Lives Ever Mattered by Mamiya Abu-Jamal. Let's pick up where we left off on page 166. <clears throat> the video, oh, excuse me. Disturbing the Peace, October 28th, 2015. The video is stunning. A muscular cop leans over a skinny schoolgirl, flips the chair in which she sits, sending her on a hard fall to the floor on her back. Before she can disentangle herself from the desk chair, she is seized and thrown across the room like a rag doll. She is immediately handcuffed and arrested for, quote, disturbing, end quote, her classroom. <clears throat> According to published accounts, she was said to have been a non-participant in class in order to leave the classroom. When she refused to leave, the school's so-called, quote, resource officer, end quote, was notified. When Officer Ben Fields, a cop, arrived at the classroom, he went into Rambo mode on the girl. The rest is infamy. Several months ago, a video showed a mad, quote, robocop, end quote, assaulting a young teenage girl in a bikini. This latest police attack on a young girl is almost identical, except that it happened in the classroom. Consider this. The girl in the class never assaulted anyone, never threatened anyone. She merely refused to leave. Such incidents tell us the nature of public schools and, more ominously, the nature of police. Are cops there to protect the students, or are they there as authoritarian instruments to assist the staff to discipline the students? What is the function of teachers, to impose blind obedience or to teach creative freedom? Events such as these show us an ugly, unpopular, uncomfortable truth about American schools and how they interact in the lives of children, especially black children. Video evidence of a beefy black cop throwing a white teenage girl across a classroom would have evoked an immediate response. That this has not speaks volumes about the degraded value of the lives and well-being of black children in America today. And that brings us to the end of that passage. I think immediately I think about the culmination of of children that have been or stories about children that we have heard stories about police terrorism that has inflicted children directly and then thinking about the amount of times where they are indirectly affected by these police terrorisms when it happens to their father or, or to their siblings or when it happens to people in their lives that are older and then whether it be the the shooting of tamir rice uh and then Tamir Rice's sister being witness, firsthand witness to it, and then not being allowed to go to her brother as a child. Those is direct and indirect police terrorism being enacted upon them. Uh, really both direct, but if you know what I mean. I, as, I, I mean direct and indirect in the sense that the macro aggression was done to Tamir Rice specifically and his, his sister being witness to it indirectly. Uh, it's, it's also has that trauma done to her uh, and, and in some sense directly as well. I'm not trying to, let's not get into semantics. I'm just saying let's not, I'm the one doing it. Uh, okay, so anyways, <clears throat> and then when you think about the teenagers and the younger people that we have heard about being assaulted in the streets, uh, in, in public areas and in, in, in communities by these police officers. And then as we hear about these stories of, in this specific passage about a school resource officer assaulting a child within school, within, uh, within the confines of a classroom. And so again, we're just c consistently reminded that this, this specter of violence is, hangs over the head of, of people of color, uh, specifically in this, in these moments, in this, these, this piece of literature passage here, uh, black pe black children. And I remember the first time I began to go to public schools, I spent kindergarten through sixth grade in a private school, in private schools. And in seventh grade, I went to Lincoln Middle School in Rockford, Illinois. That was the first public school I attended. And the first thing I noticed was that it was police officers in the school. And that was very foreign from my experience at 
the previous private schools I had went to. I went to Christian Life in sixth grade and here in Rockford, Illinois, Faith Academy for fourth and fifth grade, which is was in Rockford, Illinois. I'm not sure if it's still here. And then I lived in Texas before then, and I went to a school called Urban Christian Academy. And so to go to see police officers in school was a drastic change for me. The, it changed the complete dynamic and atmosphere and what it felt like walking in the hallways. And it wasn't until I would become older and old enough to understand some of these issues that I would be able to really grasp what it meant that these police officers were in these public schools and not in these private schools. And if it was truly about protection and uh, uh, security, you would see you would see police officers or some type of extreme private security inside the private schools because people are paying more money for their children to go to school in these places uh, or paying money for their children to go to school in these places. But that's not the type of atmosphere that you want, that when you walk into a into a building and it's police officers all on every floor and multiple have police officers doing lockdowns and searching the school grounds with canines and it basically inflicting police terrorism on the grounds of the school. It takes away from the ability to learn. It takes away from the feeling of safety. I felt more safe in the schools that did not have the police officers than I felt in the schools with the police officers. Uh, and so I think that, again, these police officers are there to to begin the process, whether they understand it or not, institutionally what they are being and systematically and, sy and systematically what they are being used for is to begin the process of the school to prison pipeline, to begin the process of institutionalizing uh, these children, to begin the process of getting these children into the system and knowing who these kids are from school so that way they can identify them in the streets and all types of other nefarious and malicious things that have nothing to do with protection, have nothing to do with serving, and have everything to do with subjugating and marginalizing and uh, maintaining status quo. And so again, we're just another layer of how police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice lingers in our society. Next passage. Badge of Racism, December 14th, 2015. As the first phase of the trial of police officer Daniel Holt's claw comes to a close, one is forced to take stock of what the trial and the lack of media coverage it and the lack of media covering it mean. Holt's Claw, a 28-year-old white Oklahoma cop, was recently convicted of 18 charges of sexual assault, rape, sodomy, and related offenses, the targeting and raping of some 13 black women and teenagers. An Oklahoma jury recommended that the man be sentenced to some 260 years in prison. If you winked, however, you would have missed it. A serial rapist of 13 women and teens? When isn't that a story? When the 13 people are black people. Only one cable network, the black-owned TV1 news program, hosted by former CNN contributor Roland Martin, covered the case using Internet reports from people in court. No one else? Not one? Why not? Apparently, because in white America, black lives don't matter. Holt's Claw used his uniform, his badge, and his loaded gun to stop, intimidate, and rape more than a dozen women, sometimes in his own patrol vehicle, sometimes right on a victim's front porch. And people wonder why people in the black community don't trust cops. It took DNA and GPS evidence to bust this villain. But how can anyone even contemplate something so sick? Easy. Most of the victims were black women from low-income communities. Some have been charged with being sex workers. Others charged with drug violations. In other words, the most vulnerable and voiceless people. This cop carefully chose those who he knew had no social power and little ability to resist. And media silence reinforced his narrative by belittling the worth of these American women. If they had covered these crimes and valued the dignity of the victims, they would have cast a harsh national light on the culture of police authority and impunity. They chose not to. Like a cop standing over a body in the road, 
They essentially said, quote, keep moving. There's nothing to see here. Keep it moving. End quote. Have black lives ever mattered? Okay, that gets us to the end of that passage. I, I've not, I, I have not heard of this story before. And again, one of the reasons that I... I got to move this mic cord, so my fault, y'all. One of the reasons that I think it's important for us to read through through, the, through these different pieces of literature that that have these that have documented these events of police terrorism and mass incarceration that have taken place in different areas of the nation is so that way we can see all the different forms that these issues that these macroaggressions take when these issues manifest so that way we can be able to identify how those forms or how those things have manifested here at different points in time so that way we can point people to uh, the fact that something that that this issue is not an isolated one that these things that happen in Rockford uh, also do happen in Harlem or also do happen in Oakland but they happen in a way that's different or specific or uh, unique to Harlem or unique to Oakland uh, but they happen uh, nationwide so the institution Nationwide, of policing is corrupt, is prejudiced, is biased, is racist, is uh, exploitative, oppressive. But also, the institution of policing locally manifests those same things. But they won't manifest it the same way in every city and in every state. Uh, and so, I guess what I'm saying is, is, is power in knowing what things have happened in Cleveland, Ohio, when it comes to police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice. So that way you know what you're searching for when you look through the history of Rockford or look through the history of Winnebago County or look through the, uh, or even look towards the future. Uh, it's important to know how in Oakland they have combated police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice. So that way you can try to figure out which way, which of those tactics or ideologies you can incorporate into Rockford, into Winnebago County to combat uh, police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice. Uh, and, and again, this, this also gets us into understanding the importance of solidarity and how solidarity works. It gets us into understanding uh, intersectionality and how intersectionality works and how uh, and, and all of those things get us into a place of, under, of collectivism, of a deeper collectivism. And knowing when you can know the history of what's happened in Chicago with police terrorism, mass incarceration and racial injustice, uh, when, in, when it, uh, macro aggression manifests there, you can go and be a body there and go and be an, an, an agent there and go in and because you know the history of the things that have happened or in Cleveland or in Florida, you know, in all these different places, you know. Uh, and so... Let's uh here, let's let's keep on reading through here. Uh hold on real quick. I mean I gotta get my glove and my glove back on. It's a little chilly. I'm gonna sit the mic down real quick. Alright. Oh damn, I think I lost the page. Hold on. Okay. Oh, man. My fault. Damn. My finger's stuck on my glove. All right. Because he is a black child. December 28th, 2015. The nightly news mentions in passing that Cleveland officials will file no charges against a police officer who killed 12-year-old child Tamir Rice. There is something shattering about the death, the killing of a child. When a child dies, the natural order is torn. The stars weep and the earth quakes. We have become so accustomed to the atrocities of this system that we are lured to accept them as natural instead of as intolerable and preventable human impositions. Politicians in the pocket of so-called police unions bow before bags of silver and blink away the death of a child, especially if a black child. What man-made institution is worth more than life of a child? 
What man-made institution is worth more than the life of a child? What job? What profession? What office? What state? When a child dies, adults that don't deserve to breathe their stolen air. When a child dies, adults don't deserve to breathe their stolen air. When a child dies, the living must not rest until they have purged the poison that dared harm such a soul. When a child dies, time runs backward and attempts to right such a wrong. Such acts challenge our very humanity and should inspire movements worldwide to fight like never before. For something vile has happened before our eyes. A child has been killed, and in America, because he is a black child, it means next to nothing. Let's just uh, move to the next passage. Killed by cops who were just, quote, doing their jobs, end quote, July 7th, 2016. And now comes another. Alton Sterling, father, husband, beloved of his family and friends, joins a tragic train of death. Mike Brown, Rakia Boyd, Eric Garner, Sandra Bland, Tamir Rice, and on and on and on and on. All killed by cops who were, quote, just doing their jobs, end quote. At times like these, Elections seem irrelevant, for they have no answer to this gnawing state of terror. No answer at all. Why should they? They were architects of it. They campaigned for these killers. They approved their militarization, arming them with weapons of war. The politicians running for, or running from, office today were gung ho for cops yesterday sending them more and more of the people's tax dollars, as well as more and more military weapons. What did they expect? And within hours of Sterling's killing, another black man, Philando Castile, was gunned down in the front seat of his car as his lover watched in horror, while reaching for the ID and registration that a traffic cop demanded him to hand over. Another one gone, and another, and another. What happens to a dream deferred? July 10th, 2016. The events of last week continue to reverberate throughout national consciousness. The unprovoked killings by cops in the streets of America's Midwest and the subsequent killing of cops in Texas show us that a new stage has been reached in America's longest war within itself. When Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. led anti-segregation protests in Selma, Alabama in the 1960s, cops didn't, quote, assist, end quote, protesters. They beat them savagely for violating the unjust laws of white supremacy. They beat men and women indiscriminately to protect white privilege. The Edmund Pettus Bridge became slick with black blood. Today, the institutional descendants of white slave patrols kill black people of all ages with utter impunity. Prosecutors direct grand juries to defend cops who kill. Not so secret judges repeatedly rule, quote, justifiable homicide, end quote. And killer cops get off free time and time again simply by claiming self-defense. Indeed, the U.S. justice system perpetuates immunity for police by maintaining the loophole of self-defense. Quote, good job, end quote, and then nothing. Today, media, politicians, and police call the Texas shooter, Micah Xavier Johnson, a madman. One prominent politician calls him, quote, deranged, end quote. But if he is mentally disturbed... What made him so? Was he mad when he went to kill Afghanis on behalf of the shrinking U.S. empire? Perhaps they trained him far too well. Oppression can drive people mad. It can turn calm brains into minds consumed by anger, rage, and resentment. The media, ministers, and politicians will call him names, but he is beyond your curses now. 
His life was a curse already. To be born a nigger in America, that's curse enough. In 1951, the great poet Langston Hughes wrote in his poem, quote, Harlem, end quote. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat? Or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. Or does it explode? Okay, that brings us to the end of that passage. I read a couple of those passages together. The, I think the killed by cops and the what happens to a dream to fart. Well, I, the killed by cops? Uh, because he is a black child and killed by... Well, I guess I read those last three all together. Uh, I think... And I've said this a few times at different points in the book, but I think that, uh, and he does a good job. Mamiya Abu-Jamal, I think, does a great job with continuing to say these names and continuing as we to, to date back to other stories and uh, to let you see the load, the, the receipts, the straws. You know, I, to me, I think this is this does a good job of explaining to people who may, and I've, this is for, it's doing, for me as well as doing this, this is what's happening for me as I'm reading it, of understanding why what took place in 2020 took place in the manner that it did and understanding why uh, the murder of George Floyd was a, a tipping point and understanding the inevitability of another tipping point like this because of the fact that these there was not a true attempt made to address and absolve these issues out of our society in 2020 after George Floyd was murdered and when you continue to hear these name after name and story after story and then another one gets added to it and then that name's on top of the the names that you were just reading about before and uh, I think that's one of the things that we want that we believe that the memorials down here downtown in Rockford, Illinois does the job of doing is that you see one and you see another and you see the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one, the sixth one. And uh, you see all these people that from diff with different experiences. Uh, and so it lets you know that it, it's, it, it has to be something, a deeper issue than just uh, not non-compliance when you see how many different people from different walks of life have been wrapped up into these uh to these events and have had their lives taken away and uh specifically in here these people are are dying but they're for each one person who dies from these macroaggressions there's probably five to ten who survived them uh and so i think that was the main thing that i got from the, the these last passages was just the heaviness of it all and i think that that poem that uh that he put in from langston hughes perfectly describes you know what it feels like to get to 100, page 174 of this book. Let's see, where we at? Where we at on time? Man, this shit heavy. 23 minutes. All right, we got another, we gonna do another passage. All right. Move, August 1st, 2016. August had barely broken his first week when police gunfire shattered the tense early morning air. It was West Philadelphia, 1978, just blocks from Drexel University. For over a year, Philadelphia police had occupied the neighborhood of Powhatan Village under orders of the city's racist mayor, Frank L. Rizzo. Why were they there? Ostensibly to arrest members of the naturalist organization, MOVE allegedly for failure to obey court orders to appear. Police were there, in Rizzo's words, to, quote, starve them out, end quote, to drive them from their communal home. In truth, the Philadelphia Police Department was there to kill. The homes across from the organization's family's residence were taken over by heavily armed cops, many of whom were displaying sniper rifles and automatic weapons. The men, women, and children living in the move home endured months of terrifying psychological pressure. 
The area had the feel of a military occupation, complete with constant surveillance and checkpoints. People who could not produce adequate identification, for example, were denied entry to the neighborhood. On August 8, 1978, all hell broke loose when cops opened fire on the families across the street. The shooting forced the move people to seek safety in the basement. The police responded with fire hoses in an attempt to flush them out or drown them in the process. When move members left their homes, all present were arrested. Some, like Delbert Africa, were brutally beaten, kicked, rifle butted, and then arrested. All nine people were charged with killing one cop. From that point to this, move members were treated like a disease. From the preliminary hearings to trial and through a handful of appeals, move members have been judici judicially assaulted, denied every alleged constitutional right. From the right of self-representation to the right to a fair judge to the right to sentencing and beyond, all move members have ever heard is, quote, no, end quote. The judge who presided over the trial, Edwin Malmed, told his commentator during an on-air interview on the Frankfurt talk show, Frank Ford talk show, that he hadn't, quote, the faintest idea, end quote, who killed the cop during the day-long shootout. Quote, they were tried as a family. I convicted them as a family, end quote, he said. Nine people were sentenced to 30 to 100 years. Move members were, in fact, convicted for the audacity of living freely and proudly outside Philadelphia's white status quo. Thus, they were convicted for being who they were, families dedicated to the ecological naturalism of the MOVE organization. That was their crime. They should all be free. And so, as we end that passage, I would uh, implore people to, there's a documentary on HBO Max, and I'm sure you probably can watch it in other places as well, about the move, the move uh, organization, the move organization, and about John Africa and Delbert Africa and about the things that took place with them in Philadelphia, and it traces all the way, traces the these events all the way to 2020, as told from the uh, point of view of the son of John Africa, I believe. So I would implore people to go uh, look that up. I think another one of the things that stands out to me from this passage is the continue, the showing the continuation of police terrorism dating back all the way to the 70s in Philadelphia and showing, and, and it does a good job of displaying the different ways in which the police terrorism has evolved and adjusted throughout time, and, but still with the same impotence on protecting the the status quo. And so I want to thank people for taking the time to listen to this. I want to please ask you to share this on whatever platform you're listening to it on. Again, we do these Rafa Reading Dailies to give uh, everyone an opportunity every day to either begin on their journey to struggle to end police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice, or to further their journey to end police terrorism, mass incarceration and racial injustice. All right, we outside.